Tonight is a good opportunity to share with you the experience of one of our rising stars who has benefited from the funding and other support we can provide. Before introducing our guest rising star, it is important to recognise that success in the sporting arena is more often than not a team effort involving the support of parents, coaches, medical support staff and so on. The people who provide the support are often the unsung heroes. And so it is a real pleasure this evening to introduce one such person to you. My first guest will be well known to many of you. Guernsey born and educated, he has been a practicing physiotherapist for eight years, has provided physio support to several of our Island Games teams, Commonwealth Games teams, the Guernsey FA, and more recently, Guernsey FC. In recent weeks, he has landed the plum job of head physio the Sky Cycling Team, a post which he will take up in literally a few days' time. And this team includes, amongst its number, Mark Cavendish, current BBC Sports Personality of the Year and World Road Race Champion, and Bradley Wiggins, current Olympic Track Champion. A great example of local boy done very, very well and a just reward for his dedication and hard work over many years. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm reception and your congratulations to Dan Gilmet. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. You can relax, Dan. I'm not going to ask you about the time you uh, gave me some physio after halfway through the walk of Bailiwick <laughs> when I fainted. Um, <coughs> I mentioned in my words of introduction that you've given sterling support to Island Games teams, Commonwealth Games teams, Guernsey football. What motivates you to do that? Because you do it on a voluntary basis. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, I mean, the main reason why I got involved was uh, I, when I came out to Guernsey in 2006, um, I started to help out a little bit with the Guernsey Football Association. And then uh, what happened was uh, Colin Foley, who most people know in this room, had a, a, a rather convincing conversation, persuasive conversation with me about what a good idea it would be for me to get involved with uh, St. Martin's Football Club. Um, so that happened in 2006 and then following on from that I then got involved with the Island Games Association in Rhodes in, in 2007 and in Orlando in 2009 and last year obviously in the Isle of Wight uh, and also the um, Commonwealth Games team that went to Delhi in 2010. And then obviously recently, most recently with, uh, with Guernsey, Guernsey FC. I think my real motivation for getting involved was uh, to being a competitive cyclist for the island for many years. Um, when I moved back to the island, uh, I kind of was at a stage in my life where I realised that I didn't have the time or, or probably the talent to, to keep competing at the level that I was riding at. Um, but, you know, I have an inherent passion for sport and uh, an, an internal flame for competitive spirit. And I thought, well, the best way for me to kind of maintain that is to use my profession to, to stay involved with sport at the highest level that I, that I could get. I'm fortunate enough now to be going on to work at the, the very much the highest level. And hopefully well paid as well. That's all right. I'm sure that would benefit. <laughs> now, over the years, you'll have worked with many of our top sporting individuals and teams. I know it's an unfair question, but does anybody... <coughs> One or more persons stand out in particular. Uh, it's quite a difficult, excuse me, quite a difficult question to answer, really. Um, to work with quite a few individuals within their sport, uh, and so many stand out for so many different reasons. But I think uh, I would rather focus the question on, on the teams that I work with. Um, like I said, I've been heavily involved with the Ireland Games Association and the Commonwealth Games, and you know it's been a real honour. <coughs> I think certainly with the Ireland Games, um, with the success of last year, you know being so successful in the medal table. Um, and uh, I think the thing that really stands out about all those individuals and the individual sports is their collective collectiveness. And how even within a competitive phase, you know, all the athletes are always asking, well, how did you get on in your sport? And the whole team spirit is fantastic. And, and last year really was, was quite a special team to be involved with because of the overall success. And not just the athletes, but everybody else involved in the team, from the coaching staff to the administrators to the whole process. That's a good answer. 
you should be a politician. <laughs> now, as part of our High Performance and Rising Stars program, one of our um, aspirations, and we're quite close to this, is to provide uh, athletes and performers with fast-track access to medical support and facilities. It'll be quite interesting, I think, for people to understand how important you feel that is as a practitioner for those individuals to get their injuries dealt with on a timely basis. Yeah, no, it is. Well, it, it is vitally important. Uh, I think, kind of unofficially, we already have a fast-track system because we're fortunate enough living in an island like Guernsey that we don't have waiting lists like we do in the UK. So, you know, most of our athletes already have a, a relationship with their GP or certainly know their GP who has a, a sports medicine interest within that practice. And likewise with any other health profession, whether it's a physio or an osteopath or, or a masseuse. I think the real, the real key is um, developing a system uh, similar to that, you know, systems that I worked with before, such as the Talented Athlete Support Scheme at, at Bath University, whereby you really have a, a, a point, a, a coordinator. I mean, obviously in most, most, most areas, it's generally a, a, you know, a, a, a doctor, and certainly a doctor with, not necessarily has to be a sports medicine doctor, but a professional who has a, a passion for sport. Because at the end of the day, what you want is a collective group of people whereby they're you know, physios, uh, doctors, sports nutritionists, sports psychology, it's becoming a big thing now in, in sport. Uh, it's, it's having somebody who can oversee all of those professions and bring them all together. Um, for the, you know, because at the end of the day, the, the athlete is at the centre of, of this. And it, it's their best interests that, that, that are key. Um, uh, and I think, you know, having that go, it's having that go-to person, uh, really, to, to, to make sure that, again, that all these individual professionals are, are coming together, rather than working may, maybe on their own professional game, or, you know, with their kind of sort of hidden agenda, really, and, and not feeling necessarily comfortable with sharing their knowledge or sharing, you know, what they want to do with an athlete or have, where they, what they, they feel is the best in this. Well, hopefully over the next few months we'll see that coming to fruition, working with members of the medical profession and other medical support staff. Now, under the crunch question, Mark Cavendish, a very worthy, <coughs> very popular winner of the BBC Sports Personality of the Year. Any day now, you're going to be up close and personal with him. <laughs> um, and, and Bradley, and other many, I mean some of the best cyclists in the world. What exactly is your job going to involve? Um, I mean, at the end of the day, my job is, to, is primarily the care and well-being of, of the riders and making sure that on a daily basis that you know, they can compete at their, their, at their best. Um, my role really within the team is uh, uh, kind of travelling on the road, being, being, at, being at races predominantly. Um, being at training camps, so for instance, I'm going to fly out Sunday to the training camp in New York prior to our, our next race in, in the Middle East and the week after that. Uh, so again, at training camps, it, it can be working with the sports uh, sports scientists, the individual coaches of the riders, um, assessing the riders, collecting medical data like we would do at, this, at the start of the season. So we have a benchmark to go back to with regards to injuries and, and, and a kind of injury profile, medical profile of the riders. Um, and then also uh, treating the riders if they they get injured during the season. So, you know, for instance, I could be in one place, but a rider could be somewhere else who's just had surgery and requires, you know, his needs are greater than who I'm with at the time. So the team would essentially just fly me from one place to another. So it's basically like being on call 24/7, really. But um, I think the one thing about cycling is, or professional cycling for sure, is it's a very nomadic. So the team don't have a we don't have a central base. So <clears throat> uh, if the riders get get injured, they tend to go back to their Olympic Institute. Most of them, you know, we have pretty much the best team on paper in the world this year, and most of those riders are Olympic riders. So they have we go to oversee their medical support at, at their Olymp Olympic Institute. Um, but on a daily basis on the road, you know. We're never in one place for the same day. You know, the stages can be 200 kilometres long. 
um, from one town to another. Now that also includes the hotel. So you're never in the hotel. You're in one hotel one night, in the hotel the next night. So part of my job is also transferring the medical equipment, uh, setting up almost like a pop-up, you know, medical clinic within the team hotels so when the riders arrive after the stage. Um, and also treating the riders before the stage. You know, again, we have long transfers, so the Tour de France. Uh, and some of the other tours that I worked on last year in Denmark and, and the Tour of Britain. So, you know, we had a key rider who had a very nasty crash um, at the Tour of Britain, which was a big race for the team, the, the British team. Um, so I was treating him on the back of the bus down the, down the M1 on, on the way to the stage start. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of a pretty multifaceted job. But, and very hands on. Yeah, very much so. Literally. Literally. Yeah. Dan, I really appreciate you coming along tonight. Um, I'd like to stay here while our next guest comes along. Um, thank you for sharing those thoughts with us. And I just ask everybody to put your hands together to wish Dan the best of luck in what is such an exciting opportunity for him. Thank you. Our Rising Stars initiative launched towards the end of 2010 and generously sponsored by the four corporate sponsors. Where are they? <laughs> Hopefully they'll appear on the screens behind me. This initiative has been a considerable step forward in our talent development program. So I'd like to thank personally tonight, Generali Worldwide, JW Rioi and Sons, Senkos Channel Islands and Sporting Bet for sharing our vision and our passion it's been a real pleasure working with your representatives and I feel that it's been very productive. Thank you very much. We currently have six individuals who are rising stars who provide, or sorry, who receive financial support. My next guest is one of them. She has travelled from the UK to be with us tonight. And I'm not sure if she views this as a welcome break from her gruelling training regime, but I do know that she has been training earlier today. In November 2010, the Rising Stars Committee decided that this aspiring young Olympian was worthy of our support. And I'm pleased to say that at no time over the past 12 months have we had reason to doubt the wisdom of that decision. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Erica Bodman onto the stage. Now, at this point, if Dennis Burns was here, he would obviously be commenting about or asking the question of Erica, what's it like to join another fine athlete on the stage? But of course, I'm not Dennis Burns. Thank you for coming. Um, now, initially, athletics was your main sport, high jump in particular, and you went on to gain a blue at Cambridge. But you're now a rower. How come? Well, um, I have struggled with my feet. I had impact-related injuries since I was about 14. Um, and by the time I reached the age of 19, it had gotten to the stage where if I did one high jump session, um, my feet would be hurting just in day-to-day -day life, walking around for the next two to three weeks. So we discussed surgery, um, but in the end I decided that I couldn't really be sure if my feet would be strong enough to withstand the jumping after the surgery. Um, so I decided that wasn't an option. And I know that setbacks are always a part of sport, they're just part of life. So I had to get on and find a non-impact sport that I was going to be better at. Um, at the time, I was at Cambridge University in my second year, and because I'm tall, for a girls person especially, um, all the college rowers always tried to get me to join the rowing club, um, so that seems like the obvious choice for me. And a good one. Yeah, it's paid off so far. <laughs> now many of us will have fond memories of 
to, see, to Stephen Redgrave and Matthew Pinter and of their successes in the Olympics. And my overriding thought when I see them is how fit they are. So perhaps you could share with us uh, some insight into your own training regime. And I know that we've got some video footage running there, but it's nicer to hear it in your own words. It's yeah. tough. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, I'd love to play otherwise, but it, it's really grueling. Um, so I train six days a week, 50 weeks of the year. And we do, in an average week, I'll do three, two session days and three, three session days. And then, I, well, Monday to Saturday, I have to be at the boat club at 7.30 in the morning for a briefing. And then my first session is done between 8 and half past 9. My second session will be done between about 11 and half past 12, 1 o'clock. And then if I do a third session, it'll be between about 3 and 5 in the afternoon. Um, this is a mixture of time on the water, both in my single and in crew boats, and then on the ergos, on the rowing machine. Uh, we also do weights and some conditioning and cross-training on the uh, machines in the gym. <coughs> and an important part of training is also the recovery. So in the breaks that we have between first and second session, that's one of my favourite times because it's second breakfast. Um, and at Leander Club, this new club that I joined in September, we're quite lucky because we have a kitchen and chefs there. So my breakfast, my second breakfast usually consists of a large bowl of porridge with lots of brown sugar, um, toast with bacon and eggs, and fruit salad as well. Um, and my calorie consumption per day has to be around four to four and a half thousand calories. That's good that I like eating. <laughs> that kind of leads us into rising stars, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, back in November 2010, we identified you as one of our rising stars, and we've been able to provide you with financial and hopefully other support. How has that affected your ambitions and your, your scope to improve? Perhaps you could share your thoughts with us. Um, it's been amazing. I must say, it hasn't changed my ambitions as such, but it probably has changed the probability that I'll achieve my ambitions. Um, as I mentioned, it's really hard to try and work alongside rowing, um, and so the Rising Stars support has been most beneficial in allowing me to actually live as an athlete and get the proper recovery that I need. Um, and in addition to this, Rising Stars put me in contact with Jeremy um, of JW Rehoys, and they very generously bought me my new boat um, for the single, and I got that in September. Um, and this is what I do most of my training in, and it's going to carry me through the next Olympiad to Rio in 2016, so that's really exciting. Um, aside from that, I have lots of local support um, from individuals, and also Colin Valleys, who welcomes me to train at the Fitness Factory every time I come home, which is amazing. They let me sleep on their sofa and eat breakfast in between my sessions and pretty much live at the fitness factory while I'm here. So, again, it's a, another great example of a team effort for support. Yes, you yeah. And then in the UK, I've got coaches and physios and doctors, and my parents are always on the other side of the phone, and they always get the most tired and grumpy side of me, so sorry for that. <laughs> Erica, I've never seen you grumpy. Not ever. Oh, I can't I believe <laughs> Now, you're currently a member of the Great Britain High Performance Women's Squad. Could you explain where this places you in the pecking order of British rowing and your ambitions for the future? Um, well, at the moment I'm ranked as one of the top single scholars outside of the GB squad, outside of the senior squad. Um, and this is really encouraging for me because the single scholars in the GB squad are kind of at the top of the ranking. Um, and as you might know, GB is also the top rowing nation in the world, um, going on the World Championship results and previous Olympics. So that puts me in a really strong position, I feel, internationally. Um, looking towards the future, I'm going to be attending the Olympic trials in March. Wow. And that's really exciting for me, just to be invited. Um, and where will that be? It, that's at Dorney. Which is where the Olympics are. Yes, yeah, that's the Olympic Lake. Um, 
So I'm hoping that I'll be able to go and surprise a few people at that, and hopefully my staff as well. Um, and then, really, I'm looking more towards the next Olympiad and Rio in 2016. So, in the four and a bit years. <coughs> well, we wish you well in that. Now, before I let both of you go, <coughs> I've just got one final question for each of you. We have many young and aspiring individuals with us here tonight. And if you were asked to give just one piece of advice to those young people, one piece of advice, and I know it's an unfair question, what would it be? And I think it's ladies first. So, Erica? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would have to say it has to be self-belief. Self-belief in what you can achieve and your talents and the way you're going to achieve them. Um, there are always going to be obstacles, whether it be people suggesting that you should just get a proper job, um, something that pays you money, um, or if it's you don't want to get up at 6.30 in the morning because it's pitch black and it's minus five degrees outside and you have to go on the water. Um, but one of my favourite quotes is by Henry Ford, and he said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're probably right. Yeah, well said. Thank you for that. Follow that, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think mine, mine would be listen. Uh, listen to the people around you, whether it's your parents or your coaches uh, or the other, the other people involved in your process. So, but for me, as, as a physio or whether it's a strength and conditioning person, and actually listen to the senior athletes within your team or within your sport or your club because a lot of them have probably been there and done it already and they know the pitfalls and you know just absorb the information really and uh, like Erica says you know you've got to stick to your self-belief and, and yeah it's vital isn't it thank you both very much indeed